Well, hey, praise the Lord, I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Line by Line podcast. Once again, coming to you with a Bible study for your soul. Amen. We pray that all is well once again between you and the Lord as we come to you. Amen. Uh, we are streaming right now live over Facebook and YouTube and, as, call, as always, Spreaker.com. Amen. That is our podcast platform. You go there, you'll find all the other podcasts that the Lord has graced us to be able to produce over the years. We are a teaching and preaching ministry dedicated to the propagation and proclamation of the Word of God. That's what we do here at That's the Word Ministries. Amen. And once again, by going to Spreaker.com, you can you can uh, see our network of podcasts that the Lord has uh, allowed us to put together. Amen. You can also find us at our website, which is That's the Word.org. And also you can go over to our YouTube channel, which is That's the Word Ministries. Amen. Hopefully, if you have not done so already, you can become a subscriber to our channel. Amen. Well, tonight we are going to continue with our verse-by-verse study in the book of Matthew. We are in chapter 9, right at the beginning. And so you've come and you've joined us at a good time, right at the beginning of a particular chapter. Amen. And so we're going to get underway with the Word of God and a word of prayer right after this. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. We are back. Amen. And we just want to remind you once again, the day is fast approaching. We are only three days away from the release of our brand new book entitled Churchified or Sanctified. It will be available on Amazon.com. Amen. And so we're very excited about that and we are anticipating its release. Amen. So we just want to bless the Lord and thank him for all that he is doing. Amen. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Lord, we bless your name tonight. We thank you once again for giving us an opportunity uh, to once again open up your word. Uh, Lord, we know that your word uh, continues to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, Lord, we pray that we will hide your word in our heart that we might not sin against you. Lord, teach us, mold us, shape us, Lord Jesus, uh, by your word. Lord, we pray that you will bless us and keep us. Lord, help us that we do no violence to your word, even as as your word goes forth. Lord, open up our eyes. Help us to see clearly uh the wonderful things that are contained in your word amen we bless you we honor you we thank you in jesus name amen and amen hallelujah we bless the name of the lord god bless you my sister charity god bless you amen we thank the lord for you amen well we are in matthew chapter number nine amen matthew chapter number nine and we are going to uh begin uh, right here in chapter number, rather in verse number one. It says, and he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. Now, that needs a little bit of explanation. His own city. We find out uh, from the book of uh, Matthew, uh, chapter number four. Let's go to Matthew chapter number four. And let's go to chapter number four. And let's read in verse number 13. Uh, It says here, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea, in the borders of Zabulon and Nephthalim. It says that he dwelt in Capernaum. And so when he, when the Bible speaks here in chapter number nine about Jesus coming into his own city, it is speaking about Capernaum. He came into his own city. Verse number two, and behold... They brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And now we see here uh, how Matthew 
takes this entire scene, this, this, this particular story that we find in the book of uh, Mark and the book of Luke. Uh, Mark really uh, stretches it out and tells us all of the little intricacies uh, involved in this story. Uh, the four men who had a friend who was paralyzed, that's what the word palsy means, uh, he was paralyzed and, and how they took him to see where Jesus was because uh, as it says in the book of Mark, Jesus was in the house. I love that phrase. Jesus was in the house. And when they get there, because there were so many people trying to get to Jesus through the door uh, at the entrance, that they decided that they would go up to the roof with their friend who was paralyzed and break open the roof and and uh, uh, bring him down through the roof. And so all of this is what happens. Matthew, of course, he, had, he doesn't mention all of that, but here is what Matthew says. They brought to him a man sick of the palsy. That They, they are the four men lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, seeing what they did, seeing how they saw no way to get in, but didn't say there's no, there's no hope. Uh, there's no chance. Uh, we, we should just go home. We should just give up. Seeing their faith. They went, they went around and they made a way. <laughs> they made a way. They did not give up. Amen. And through this, Jesus says to them, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, there's something going on here. There's something going on here, here in verse number two and, and these next few verses down to at least verse number eight that we need to look at. Here we see that Jesus is interested in the whole man. That is that is understandable that we remember that. God bless you, Tracy, and God bless you, uh, C, G, R, amen? Uh, it is very important that we understand that Jesus is interested in the whole man, okay? Let's establish that, okay? But here we see something that Jesus does that we should not miss. It says here, and it also remember in the book of Mark and the book of Luke brings this all out, that Jesus immediately upon seeing their faith, remember the reason why the four men bring their friend. The four men bring their friend because he is paralyzed. They want their friend to be healed physically. This is what they were, this is what was on their mind. This was their this was their their motive. This is why they came to see Jesus. But Jesus seeing their faith, he seeing their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, "Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee." The man is still paralyzed. The man is still paralyzed. Jesus didn't approach his physical healing as of yet. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. There's a certain type of faith that Jesus is looking for. Amen? There's a certain kind of faith. God bless you, my sister Tonda. There's a certain type of faith that Jesus is looking for. And when Jesus finds it, he will respond to it. Amen? He will respond to it. These four men, these four men, th these five men, okay, they all had faith. The four men who carried their friend who was paralyzed, they didn't give up. So they also had faith. It must be established that they also had faith. But we see here that Jesus turns to the sick one. Jesus turns to the man who was physically paralyzed, who was there to be physically healed. And Jesus says, your sins be forgiven. This makes a powerful statement concerning Jesus. Remember, Jesus is concerned with the whole man. But the saving of the soul, the saving of the soul has precedence. This is a bold statement, but I believe it to be true. The saving of the soul, for those who are unsaved, of course, the saving of the soul has precedence over physical healing. I'm not saying that the saving of the soul is better. All I'm saying is Jesus is concerned about the soul. You see, an, an individual can go to heaven
with a broken body. Yes, and there are many people who have gone to heaven with broken bodies, who, who lived this life in a, in a sick condition, but when they got to glory, of course, they, they are no longer sick. We, we know this happens, and, and it has happened, and, and it will happen. But here's what we know. Jesus wants to see souls saved. It's the reason why Jesus came to earth. We read about Jesus' own, uh, his own uh, mission statement in Luke chapter number 4, uh, what he came to do and what uh, it was that he did do. And so here, these men exhibiting the type of faith that was necessary. They had faith that Jesus was who he said he was. And Jesus reaches out and forgives the man's sins before he heals his body. He didn't send him away unhealed. His soul was now healed. Absolutely. And that was what is most important, that his soul be healed. But then it goes on. Verse number three. Behold, certain of the scribes and uh, said within themselves, this man blasphemes. And they said that Christ was a blasphemer, which is, which is blasphemy itself, saying this about Jesus. Because in their mind, they understood that only God could forgive sins. That's, this is a, that's a God thing. Only God forgives sin. That's what's going on in their mind. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, knowing their thoughts, uh, John chapter 2, verse 25, says that Jesus knew what was in man. You see, there were times when Jesus uh, set aside his deity, and you see Jesus asking questions. You see him going with people and, and doing certain things that we who are human do, because he chose to set aside his deity. But there were those moments, there were those moments throughout his ministry where he allowed uh, his deity to shine forth. And here is one of those times. He knew their thoughts. He knew exactly what they were thinking. And he says, why do you think evil in your hearts? Why are you thinking this way? For whether is easier, he says, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk. Which is easier? Okay. Now, when he makes when he makes uh, when he makes this statement, when he's talking about is it easier, it was easier, it was easier for them to see someone be healed. That was the more uh, that could be verified. Okay, a physical healing could be verified, but how do you show that someone's sins uh, have been uh, forgiven? Amen. Um, so when we read this, okay. When he re when we when we read this, he's saying, "Look, here is what he is going to do right here in verse number six. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, and he turns to the man who was sick. Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Now the man is healed. Now." He is whole. Now he is both spiritually healed, and now he is both now he is also physically healed. Okay? So Jesus drew attention to his physical healing in order to draw attention to his spiritual healing. Yes, he said, what did he say here? In order that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth. To forgive sins, okay? So they were wrong in their estimation, okay? And he arose and departed to his house. He got up. He was no longer paralyzed. He got up and walked in his own power to his own house, okay? That's what Jesus did. But when the multitudes saw it, they marveled and they, and they glorified God, which had given such power unto men, okay, talking about Jesus, and now, which is most important, let me ask you that question, we've already pretty much uh, answered it, but what do you think is most important, is it more important that an individual be physically healed, or is it more important that a person be spiritually healed, 
uh, because when we read, when we read in Isaiah chapter 53, when it says by his stripes, we are healed. It's talking about the whole man. It's talking about the whole man, but in view, pre the predominant view is that he is speaking about those who are, who need uh, spiritual healing by his stripes. The punishment that he took, we are healed spiritually and physically. Of course, physical healing is part of the atonement. Okay, as proven by countless healings over the years. Proven by the fact that Jesus uh, healed folks. That, that the apostles went about uh, healing people throughout their ministry after Christ had gone back into heaven. So healing is a part of the atonement. We believe that Jesus can heal, that he does still heal. There are people, there are people within the body who do not believe in the supernatural. They do not believe in miracles. We believe in miracles. Amen. Jesus still heals. Amen. And many of you, I'm sure, uh, can attest to that fact. You can testify to the fact that Jesus heals. He is either, you have either known people that he has healed or you yourself have been healed by his power. So Jesus still heals. Amen. Now, <clears throat> verse number nine, as Jesus passed forth from thence, as he's moving along from here, he saw a man named Matthew. In other places in scripture, he is identified as a man by the name of Levi. It's the same person, Matthew or Levi. And here, uh, here it says, God bless you, Dawn. And here it says, uh, sitting at the receipt of custom, there was sort of a sort of a booth uh, where the tax collectors did uh, their transactions, uh, and many of their tax, uh, many of their transactions were dishonest. Uh, Matthew was a publican, and publicans were hated because they were uh, employed by the Roman government. And they set their own financial standards and they would rob from the people. And it, it, it was a terrible mess. But that's what publicans were known for. But here it says that Matthew, sitting at the receipt of custom, and Jesus saith unto him, follow me. That's it. He said, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And followed him. Would to God that when an individual hears the voice of the Lord speaking to him or her. Would to God that when someone recognizes that the Lord is calling them, that they would respond as quickly as Matthew did. The disciples who Jesus called at the very beginning of his ministry, they were fishing and they just got up and they followed him. They left their nets, they left their fishing rods, they left, the, uh, they left their father, they just got up and followed Jesus. Here we see, once again, Matthew stops what he is doing, and he follows Jesus. And I have to, let me just add, I'm not trying to add the scripture, but I'm going to assume, assume that the Spirit of God had been dealing with uh, Matthew, that probably, maybe, Matthew had heard Jesus speak, he had heard of Jesus, and the things that he had said, or had seen the things that he had done, but he was yet... Uh, doing what he was doing, and he was troubled by his own uh, lifestyle. And this is all conjecture. I'm not trying to, once again, add anything to Scripture. But this can be a scenario uh, that may have taken place uh, with Matthew. So when, as soon as Jesus says, follow me, he gets up, he leaves everything behind, and he followed him. No questions asked. He didn't stop and say, listen, I need to go and, and take care of some things first. He didn't uh, uh, talk it over with someone and said, listen, I have this I have this situation. Someone told me to come and I don't know what. I, he just got up from the voice of Jesus telling him to come. He got up and he came to Jesus. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Now we find out from other places that this house that Jesus was in was Matthew's house. This was now Matthew's house. Matthew was a man. Listen, publicans uh, had, let me use this. We understand what this means. Publicans, because of their dishonest ways and lifestyle, they had money. They had money. So Jesus here finds himself in Matthew's 
house. And the people that are in the house are Matthew's friends. It says here, many publicans and sinners, uh, other uh, non-righteous, use that in, uh, in quotations, other unsaved people, uh, they were there and they came down and sat with him and his disciples. So here's the scene. They're at Matthew's house and Jesus is there surrounded by many other dishonest and unscrupulous people and his disciples were with him. And when the Pharisees, in verse number 11, when the Pharisees saw what was taking place, it says, when they saw it, they said unto his disciples, talking about Jesus, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Why is your Jesus, your master, your teacher, why is he sitting down and fellowshipping eating with these types of people because uh, the Pharisees would never be seen with, mingling with these types of people. They were too righteous to do such a thing. And so they, since Jesus proclaims to be this righteous man, why is he taking his time and mingling with these types of people? We better be gracious. We better be grateful. We need to be grateful that he did such a thing and that he does such a thing. Because yes, if you reject who Jesus is, there is a price to pay. Yes, if you are not obedient, yes, there will be a price to pay. Yes, if you don't come when Jesus calls, yes, if you if you leave this world having yet continued to reject Christ, there will be a price to pay. But Jesus is proven by this, what Jesus does here, he is the friend of sinners. Jesus is the friend of sinners. We read in uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse uh, number 8. Uh, let me go there real quick. Matthew, uh, Romans rather, uh, chapter number 5 and verse number 8. Let me get that real, real quick. I'm sorry. But God commendeth his love toward us, even in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No, no. He is the friend of sinners. When sinners come to him, the Bible says that he will in no wise cast them out. You're my enemy. Get away from me. I don't want you next to me. No, you're an enemy. I will not come next to you. Just back up, back up. No, that's not. That's not Jesus. Jesus is the friend of sinners. He is the friend. Now, so you want him to be your friend and not your judge. That is why we need to receive him. That is why we do not need to reject him. Amen. He is uh, the friend of sinners. Amen. And it is true. It is true. Okay. Verse number 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Amen, Tracy T. Amen. Now, what does what does he mean? What does Jesus mean by these words? Let me continue in verse number 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Now, what he's talking about here, verse number 12, listen, and I've said this for years. If you don't need Jesus, if a person comes to the conclusion that they don't need Jesus, then for that person, Jesus didn't come for you. Even though Jesus came, he came for all who will come to them. But if an individual uh, comes to the conclusion that they don't need Jesus, then they will not receive Jesus. Jesus will not force himself upon anyone. Amen. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 30 and verse number 46. It says, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first 
have been spoken to you. He's talking about the Jews. Paul and Barnabas were missionaries at first, and they went to the Jews, okay? And here it says here, but seeing that you put it from you, the words that we've spoken, we've reached out, we've told you about Jesus and who he is and what he has done and what he wants to do. We've called you to repent and to confess. He says, seeing that you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, he says, lo, we go, we turn rather, to the Gentiles. You see, they were guilty of casting away, shoving aside. If anybody, if you've ever sat at a table, or maybe it's not having to do with food. If you've ever, someone ever put something in front of you and you just decide that's not something that you want to do, and you just sort of just brush it off. No, this is not for me. You just push it away. It's 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 a sign. Uh, it's a sign of disrespect. They were these Jews here in in chapter number thirteen of the book of Acts. They were saying, Jesus, your words have no meaning to us. They are not for us. We do not want to hear these words. They don't apply to us. And so they designate themselves as those who don't need what Jesus has. And they push his word away. And this is what you see uh, Jesus uh, speaking about here back in Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 12. God bless, you. God bless you, Donna, and God bless you, Kathleen. God bless you. Here he says, they that be whole don't need a physician. If you think you're all right, you don't need Jesus even though you do, but you've come to that conclusion that you don't need Jesus. They that be whole or complete or uh, self-righteous don't need a doctor. Jesus came to heal. He came to heal. But if you're well, who needs a doctor when you're well? That's what they're saying. But they that are sick, and once again in verse number 13, the part, the second part, for I am not come to call the righteous. Jesus was being sarcastic with that statement. He has not come to call the righteous. Not really the righteous, but he has not come to call the self-righteous. But sinners to repentance. When an individual realizes that they are a sinner, that's when Jesus can step in. That is when Jesus can help. But before a person uh, can be helped, they have to realize the state that they are in. They have to realize, they have to come uh, to a, a poor in spirit state. They have to realize that they need more than what they have. Amen. They have to come to that place uh, in a sense that Paul the Apostle came to uh, in the book of Romans. He had, You have to come to that wretched man moment. What a wretched man I am. Until a person realizes their misery, their wretchedness, and their sinfulness, then they will not reach out to Jesus. They will not. Amen? And so that is very important. As long as a person feels that their righteousness is good enough, then they will never, they will never come to Jesus. We know that the Holy Spirit can change that. We know that the Holy Spirit draws. We know that the Holy Spirit will convict. Amen? You've heard my story. And I was, I was these people. I was righteous in my own eyes. Uh, just thought that I had never sinned. Thought that I really didn't do anything worthy of uh, bad treatment. But the Holy Ghost changed that. Amen. He changed it and thank God uh, that he did. Amen. Verse number 13, we see here uh, a phrase that is taken from the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter number six and verse number six. That's where uh, where Matthew gets this from. And he says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You cannot hope to find righteousness. You cannot hope to come to Jesus through sacrifice or works or rituals or any of the things that people, uh, that many people do to try to gain access to heaven or to try and get in good graces with God, the work that you do is not enough. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It is through Jesus Christ and what he has done that we come 
to, uh, to the righteousness that is necessary. We have to come through Christ. Amen. If we don't come through Christ, it cannot happen. It says here uh, that uh, a sacrifice and works and all the things that people do uh, to try to, when they leave here, uh, to try to go to heaven. He doesn't want sacrifice. He wants mercy. If an individual will approach uh, God and ask for his mercy based on the knowledge of their own sinfulness, Jesus will save. He will save them and he will give them his righteousness. Amen. There are countless people who would say, look at all the look at all the good things that different people have done, you know, given to charity and opening up schools all over the world and and all of these things, who can say that all of these things are not good things? Uh depending on what's being done, of course. Uh but once again, the doing of works that's just that just doesn't cut it. It doesn't matter how much that you give. It doesn't matter how much that you do. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, it, it's it's not going to matter to that individual. Yes, people will be blessed by maybe the things that you have done. An individual will do. People will get blessed. But don't believe that because you have this body of works and, and things that you have done, uh, that it's going to mean that God will let you into his heaven because... Without Christ, you can't get in. Amen? Amen, Donna. Uh, Jesus is the only way. It's not by works. Amen? Verse number 14. Then came to him the disciples of John. And we see here that at this point in Jesus' ministry, John, John's uh, disciples were still in existence. There were still people who were uh, following John. Amen? And it says that, they said, why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? John's disciples wanted to know. We fast, the Pharisees fast, and we do it all the time. Why don't your disciples fast? It was an honest question. They wanted to know what is going on. And then Jesus makes this astounding statement. But with this astounding statement, Jesus begins to tell us what is taking place with his ministry and what will take place once his ministry on earth is over. He, he, begins, to, he begins to give us shades of even his own death. And resurrection, shades of it. And I'm sure they did not understand what he was talking about fully. But Jesus begins to speak. Jesus said unto him in verse number 15, unto them in verse number 15, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? We are the children of the bride chamber. Should we mourn? And one of the reasons why people fasted in the Old Testament uh, economy was, was they were in, in mourning. There was a problem. The bridegroom is Christ. So he says, as long as the bridegroom is present, why do we need to mourn? We are still, we are celebrating. The bridegroom is here. So there's no need to fast. What well, Jesus was telling them, I'm the bridegroom. I'm here. I am going, I am about to set into motion a new covenant. While I am here, there is no need for you to fast. While Jesus was right there on earth with them. No need to fast, okay? He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then shall they fast. You see, fasting Fasting is associated. Fasting is associated uh, with uh, trouble. Uh, fasting is associated with problems. Many times, many many times, people fast uh, in order to uh, because they need something or there's a personal need uh, in their life. People fast. Amen. Uh, people fast for for 
uh, uh, various reasons. You understand what I mean when I say that people fast for different reasons. But it's always because, many times, because something is needed. We want to grow closer. Uh, we, we we need an answer to prayer. There are different reasons why, why uh, we fast. But once again, he says here, while the bridegroom is here, I'm here. But when I go, when I leave, then there shall be need to fast. When I go, okay? Verse number 16. No man puts a piece of new cloth into an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment and the rent or the rip is made worse. What Jesus is saying is you cannot... What is going to happen with his ministry once he is gone, you can, he will, Jesus did not come to make and make better the old covenant. He didn't come to make the old covenant better. He came to establish a, to establish a brand new covenant, which the book of Hebrews says is a better covenant. Amen. Christ came to establish that. And so he's saying, no, you cannot put a new cloth uh, into an old garment. And he says in verse number 17, neither do men put new wine in old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. You cannot mix the old with the new. The old covenant, old covenant was not meant to be mixed with the new covenant. The new covenant is not a mixture of old and new. The new covenant is the new covenant. In other words, we are now under grace. We are no longer under law. The old covenant was based upon law. Uh, there are certain things, stopgap measures that the Lord put in place within the old covenant. I'm talking about the uh, the sacrifices, I'm talking about the feast days, all of those things uh, were stopgap measures that the, that God accepted temporarily, you know, to, to sacrifice lambs and animals and all these things as a covering for sin. When Jesus died, our sins are no longer covered. You see, the blood of bulls and goats, the book of Hebrews says the blood of bulls and goats, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin. When Jesus came, he became the perfect sacrifice. And now, our sins are no longer covered. You see, the Old Testament sacrifices, the sins were covered. Now, our sins are gone. Gone. They are erased. Our sins do not exist anymore. Uh, something that I've said for years and years in many of my classes. Listen, when we sin now, and we go to the Lord and say, Lord, Forgive me of my sin. And he cleanses us and he washes us, as it says, as it says in John chapter 1 and verse number 9. If you were to go back, and this is not something that we would do, but if you were to go back and say, Jesus, remember the sin that I did at such and such a time. Remember that time that I did this and that. But if you have already asked Jesus to forgive you, that sin is gone. The response that you would get from God if you were to be able to ask that question to him, don't you remember when I did this and that? He would say, what sin are you talking about? It's gone. It is, it is gone. It does not exist. The sin that we have committed is gone. And we need to understand that. People beat themselves up over the things that they do. And it's not good that the things that uh, people do uh, that are that are sinful. It's not a good thing. But uh, the book, the scripture says very plainly in uh, Romans chapter number eight and verse number one, there is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Satan will will come down on you because of your sin. He will take you, Satan will take you back to David. When David made uh, his, his uh, spoke his words after he sinned with Delilah, he will take you back there uh, to uh, the book of Psalms uh, and Psalm 51, uh, where he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. The guilt that he had because of his sin, 
Satan will take you back there and say, this is, this is you. This is you. No, 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 no. Me, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. David spoke those words. Truthfully, honestly, that was where he was. That was where he was. And the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit then was not the same. Understand what we mean. The Holy Spirit then was not the same as he is now in the sense that we now are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. When, G, when David said, take not your Holy Spirit from me, it was a very real possibility that that could happen. But God was merciful. God was merciful and gracious uh, to his servant David. Amen. But we, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So when Satan comes and he brings guilt and he brings all of these things against us, uh, we need to go, uh, let, let's go, let's go uh, over here to uh, the book of uh, Zechariah. Let me find it. Let me find it. I got to find it. Zechariah chapter number three. Zechariah chapter number three. I want to get there. He showed me a vision. I'm in Zechariah chapter three and verse number one. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Satan stands at our right hand to resist. Okay, to resist. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? In Christ, in Christ, all of us who are in Christ are brands plucked out of the fire. We are brands plucked out of the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. The filthy garments representing our sin. Oh yes, our sin, the things, the things that we have done. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him, he said, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. That change of raiment is the righteousness of Christ, which we have. He has forgiven us. He has washed us. He has cleansed us. He has made us brand new. Amen. He has made us brand new. But once again, Satan will come in like a flood and he will bring uh, uh, his sling, his, his, his slings and arrows, his darts, and he will try to he will try to bring guilt upon your life. You have to take him back to the cross. Take Satan back to the cross. Amen. And when you take Satan back, to the cross, he will be confronted with the victory that was won there. He will be confronted with his own defeat, amen? And that will be what will take place. We need to make sure, we need to make sure uh, that we do not uh, allow Satan to cause us uh, to see ourselves in a bad light. Give me one moment. Now, when we, uh, when we realize, when we realize what Jesus has done for us at the cross, we will be so grateful. And so once again, in verse, in verse number 16 and 17, uh, Jesus is making it known that he is establishing a brand new covenant. Amen. A brand new covenant. We're going to stop. We're going to stop. Uh, right there, but it's important that we understand the importance, the importance of the new covenant. Now we're going to continue uh, with all of these things uh, as we continue on in his word. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name and we thank you once again for giving us an opportunity to bless your name. And Lord, we do not, we are not ignorant to the fact, Lord, of your coming Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us. And Lord, we thank you for this new covenant. Lord, we thank you for the cross that you have placed before us. Lord, have your way. We bless you right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. 
God is good. Amen. God is good. God bless you, Kathleen and, and Donna. Amen. God bless you, Charity and Dawn. God bless you, Tonda. God bless you so much, and thank you uh, for being with us. God bless you, C. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. God is good, and God is working. God bless you, Tracy T. Amen. Now, on uh, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, we are going to begin a brand new series. Uh, we were talking about the cross just now. We begin a brand new series entitled Back to the Cross, Embracing the Power, the Glory, and the Victory. Amen. We're excited. Uh, we're very excited about this brand new series that we will uh, begin. Amen. We're going to take a take a look at the cross and, and talk about the meaning of the cross and 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 how and, and, and how blessed we are to be in the cross. As the old song says, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. We're going back to the cross for the next uh, several weeks on our Tuesday night, The Bible Speaks Live podcast. Amen. Also on Wednesday night, you can join us as we continue talking about the glorious church and our first principles of the Christian life. Amen. Looking forward to that. And on Sunday morning, alive and well empowering scenes from the early church. Looking forward to that. Amen. Hope you can join us. Don't forget, our new book will be coming out in just three days. Three days from now, uh, it'll be available on Amazon.com. Churchified or Sanctified, Exploring the Dangers of Religion and the Glory of Relationship. Looking forward to it. Amen. And so we're honored, we're blessed, and we thank the Lord for all that he is doing. And we pray that you'll be able to join us throughout this week. If not live, then you can catch us on the replay. Don't forget to share out this page uh, that others also may be blessed. Amen. God is working, God is moving, and we honor him and we praise him. Continue to pray for us as we continue uh, to do the work uh, of an evangelist, uh, getting his word out. We are dedicated to the propagation and proclamation of his word, amen? So we honor the Lord, we bless him, and we thank him. Thank you for joining us. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and we will see you next time. That is hopefully tomorrow night. We'll be right back here with another word from the Lord, amen? We'll see you then. Have a good night.